Hi, my name is Josephine Morganroth, and I'm the Technical Services Manager at Rockmass Technologies. Today I'll be sharing with you a presentation that I gave at the Tunneling Association of Canada conference in 2023. The subject is on machine learning applications in tunnel engineering. Specifically today I'll be presenting on a paper called Using LiDAR Enabled Digital Mapping and Machine Learning to Identify Cracks in Precast Concrete Tunnel Lining at the Ashbridge's Bay Treatment Plant Outfall Project. To simplify this, I'll be talking about LiDAR and machine learning to identify cracks at the ABTBO tunnel project. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors who helped me put this project together. First from Hatch, Elian Cabot and Andre Selecki, who both supported in the field work and the conceptualization of this project. And also Dr. Davide Elmo, who is a professor at the UBC. So first and foremost, I'd like to introduce the project that we used as a case study. The Ashbridge's Bay Treatment Plant Outfall is a 3.5 kilometer long tunnel under Lake Ontario, which goes from the water treatment plant located along the lakeshore in Toronto out underneath the lake. The tunnel is subaqueous and is mostly situated in the Georgian Bay Formation, which is a shale bedrock. Uh, and there's also a 80 meter deep shaft on shore, uh, which goes down into the tunnel. At the last kilometer of the tunnel, there are 50 riser ports, which are what diffuse or will diffuse the treated water into Lake Ontario after the tunnel is commissioned. Uh, I had the pleasure of being part of this project as the geotechnical site engineer back in 2019 to 2021, uh, when the starter tunnel and shaft were being excavated. So here's a picture on the left of me actually working in the tunnel. So as you can imagine with a subaqueous tunnel of this size there were some challenging geotechnical site conditions that were encountered. Primarily amongst those were the high groundwater inflows which ended up causing deficiencies in the PCTL segments. So on the bottom left there you can see a schematic of the tunnel underneath Lake Ontario um, and the first couple of riser pipes. With this being underneath uh, Lake Ontario there were some issues with um, groundwater and some seepage from the lake uh, making its way and applying pressure on the outside of the PCTL segments, which of course is not ideal. When we excavated underneath the first couple, it also happened to coincide with this water bearing seam, which you can see coming in and intersecting the crown of the tunnel. On the right side, you can see that this resulted in some step deformities in the PCTL segments, as well as some cracking and high groundwater inflows. You can see there within a matter of seconds, a five gallon pail is being filled. So what are the objectives of this study? This study was to study and monitor the PCTL cracks, because as we know, these cracks and deficiencies can be critical in terms of affecting stability and the integrity and overall service life of the tunnel. What we did was we completed some LiDAR-based digital mapping of these uh, segments, both to obtain accurate as-built uh, deficiencies or damages of the installed PCTL segments, and also to investigate the use of a machine learning algorithm to automatically identify these crack locations. So on the right side, you can see there the step deforming and the crack that we're trying to get the algorithm to automatically detect. And we also needed as-built records of these. On the bottom right, you can see that those um, scans ended up being used for some explicit modeling that's not within the scope of, of this paper, but that was an activity that was done as part of this project. And on the bottom right, you can see uh, that's a photo of me in the tunnel capturing the LiDAR point clouds. The focus of this presentation is on the machine learning algorithm and basically the practical methods that were used to develop that. So what is the workflow here that I'll be presenting? First is the digital mapping of those PCTL segments. Second is formatting that data for use in a machine learning algorithm. The next step is an iterative process, just like most other engineering modeling activities uh, where we developed the algorithm. The first is to develop the architecture and then test uh, what the performance is of the initial architecture. Um, after that, you enter a cycle of both hyperparameter optimization and ensemble modeling. So hyperparameter optimization is uh, the parameters that uh, control the learning of the algorithm. Um, and ensemble modeling is basically running several models in parallel so that you can get a quantification of the uncertainty of the outputs. Once that process is complete, you end up with a finalized algorithm that you can use moving forward to make engineering decisions. So just to back up a bit and to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of nomenclature and terms, um, let's talk about what machine learning is and isn't, uh, and also the what, why, and how. Machine learning is not the same thing as artificial intelligence or AI. It's actually a subset of that. Uh, machine learning is specifically the use of statistical techniques to learn pa patterns in data, and that allows the algorithms to learn from experience, which is called training. We're gonna be focused on supervised machine learning. Uh, this is a technique where 
we already know what the answer is and we're basically training the algorithm to be able to recognize that so-called answer or target so that when it's presented with new data, it can make predictions based on that. Machine learning is also really powerful because it can extract multi-dimensional relationships between input data sets. So humans usually struggle beyond three or sometimes four dimensions, but machine learning can learn from multi-dimensional data sets that can be in the hundreds of variables. So being able to use a machine learning algorithm to assist in engineering decision-making actually frees up engineering resources to select inputs and interpret results as opposed to completing the tedious data manipulation um, that can often take up a lot of time. So here is a very simple schematic of a machine learning algorithm. You have the inputs, you have one hidden layer, which has a weight and a bias, and you have an output. So the data in the input gets fired through the hidden layer uh, where an activation function decides how quote unquote important that data is, uh, and then gets used to, be, uh, to make a prediction or the output. Uh, that output then gets get compared to the target, which is the ground truth in this case. So so in our example here, it'll be whether or not there's a crack. So it's binary. It could also be something continuous like a stress state or a category like a geotechnical zone. Once that error is calculated, that gets used to back propagate into the algorithm to update those weights and biases. And once that error meets a minimum threshold, the algorithm is considered to be trained. In our case, we're using the LiDAR point cloud captured using the RockMass Eon. Uh, so the inputs are red, green, and blue channels, and also the XYZ coordinates of those uh, pixels in the point cloud. And the prediction that's being made is where the PCTL uh, cracks are. So crack or no crack. So let's talk a bit about the data collection process. So uh, for this study, I scanned uh, 20 meters of the Ash for dismay treatment plant outfall tunnel. These, this consisted of seven successive scans and took about 15 minutes to capture. So there you can see me standing in the middle of the tunnel, scanning the crown, and you can actually see the crack there in the background that is what I'm mapping. And on the right is a zoomed in version. Uh, this is actually the HD image output from the RockMass Eon, um, and that shows the crack that I was mapping. So while I'm in the field, I capture these scans, like I said, took about 15 minutes. Uh, and I also annotate digitally onto that image image where the cracks are located. So this is also one of the inputs that I'm going to use to train my algorithm um, or the so-called target or answer or ground truth that I was mentioning earlier. Once I've captured this data underground, I can export the point clouds as an XYZ uh, and also the annotated locations as a DXF. So here's a short video in Cloud Compare, which is a free and open source software. Um, these are the raw scans uh, without any data manipulation. As you can see, the LiDAR point cloud is true color RGB. Um, and there you can see also the, the crack location again. Before I can actually train an algorithm with this data, I need to format it a little bit. In this case, I'm lucky because I captured my data digitally, then there's not a lot of formatting that needs to be done. Uh, but if you're training a machine learning algorithm on some more traditional data inputs um, from uh, you know, hand-drawn mapping or less regular uh, observations, um, you do need to format that into a digital format. And it also needs to be compatible with what it is you're trying to predict. That's not in the scope of this presentation, but um, you can connect with me to ask about those types of situations if you're interested. So in this case, I took the LiDAR input here. This is a flattened version of the tunnel crown. And basically all I did was rasterize this. So each pixel has an X, Y, Z coordinate, and it also has an R, G, and B value. So red, green, blue. That was the inputs done, formatted. Next is the target data. So on the left there, you can see that's the DXF file of the annotation that I completed in the field. So that tells me where there is a crack and where there's no crack. And again, I just rasterized this. So I ended up with an image that has the same dimension as the input, um, but it has binary values of zero or one, a crack or no crack. And that's my target or output that I'm gonna use to train my algorithm. So again, in this case, a very simple data set, uh, red, green, blue for inputs and uh, zero or one for the outputs. So. The type of algorithm that you select for your particular problem is really important. There are different algorithms for different problem types. In this case, I use what's called a convolutional neural network, and this is an image processing algorithm. So these are very powerful for spatial and temporal dependencies. Uh, if you've ever done a reverse Google image search, you've definitely used a convolutional neural network before. And these are also really popular in uh, geoscience applications because we're often dealing with both spatial components to our data and 
also temporal or time steps in our data sets. I'll give you an example uh, or a schematic of what this algorithm ended up looking like. Uh, we had an input layer, and this is the red, green, and blue channels from the LiDAR. Um, we then apply uh, the convolution layer, which gives the algorithm its name. Um, and what happens here is there's a search area or filter that strides over the input image and basically tries to find strong correlations or dependencies in those cells. In this very simple example, the uh, filter is three by three pixels um, and it's striding over in a stride of two, meaning that it's taking two pixels of shifting at a time and nine pixels of area at a time to extract what are called feature maps. And those are the important correlations in that group of pixels. Next, there's some math that happens. So first, the activation function that I mentioned decides whether that feature map is important or not for predicting the output. Um, and then you have a deconvolution layer, which is basically the reverse of the convolution to sample everything everything back up to the original size. Uh, and in this case, we have a classification layer that takes that uh, feature map and decides uh, whether something is a crack or not. So it makes that prediction, uh, binary prediction in this case. And the output is this uh, tunnel map, which is the same dimension as the input. Um, and each pixel has either a zero or a one assigned to it, whether the prediction is that there's a crack there or not. So during the training process, this picture gets compared to that DXF file that I collected in the field to determine how good the prediction is. Uh, if it's within the error threshold, then we're done. If it's not within the error threshold, which is more likely the case in the early stages, uh, that error gets back propagated to update all of the uh, layers uh, prior. So this continues until we reach that minimum error threshold and then the algorithm is trained. So let's talk about, um, in my case, the kind of practical development. Um, this is a stepwise approach, just like any other modeling exercise. So let's take a look at our first attempt at training this algorithm to identify where these cracks are located. Uh, I won't show you the code, but this is basically the output that I got from my code. Uh, was that there was a global accuracy of 99.95%. So that's pretty great. But then if you look at the mean accuracy, it's got an accuracy of 49.975, which is basically guessing 50%. So what's going on here? Let's have a bit of a closer look. This is a confusion matrix. This is a type of visualization that's often used for classification algorithms, which is what we're dealing with here. And basically what it plots is the predicted class, so what the algorithm thinks a particular pixel is, versus the true class, which is the ground truth or that def file that I annotated in the field. Um, and the closer that those values match, the higher the on-diagonal values are. So we want those to be as high as possible. In this case, you can see that the algorithm is really, really good at capturing where there are no cracks but it's really not good at capturing where there are cracks at 0%. That means it's always wrong. So we have some room for improvement here. So what can we do? Um, there are a few different approaches here, um, and I've kind of listed all of these at no particular order, but some of these are easier to implement than others. The first thing we could do is look at an error weighting scheme. Error weighting is uh, when you apply a strategy at the end of the training process, so where that error gets calculated between the prediction and the output, um, and you incentivize the algorithm to learn some class over others. So in this case, we might incentivize the algorithm to learn where there are cracks versus not cracks because it's more important that it be right when there is a crack than that it be right when there isn't a crack. The other thing that you could do is look at data balancing. So in our case, we have a mostly intact lining with some very discrete locations where there are cracks in the lining. So we would want to balance that data set by augmenting where there are cracks artificially and then training the algorithm based on that information. Another thing you could do is sampling with replacement. So this is during the training process, you uh, basically have a training set and you have a testing set but you want to mix those together so you have representative samples from everywhere in the tunnel. Next, we have hyperparameter optimization. So that's tuning those uh, training parameters. So learn rate, um, the layers in your architecture, all, all those mathematical parameters, you can fine tune those. Um, and then the last thing that you should do is uh, ensemble modeling. So I talked about this very briefly at the beginning, but the output that you see here is the output from one singular machine learning model. 
But in machine learning, it's actually relatively easy to run the same model uh, tens if not hundreds of times. So you end up with a distribution of potential outputs. And um, that might sound a bit foreign, but actually if you've ever looked at the weather forecast, that's exactly what that is. It's ensemble modeling. So let's have a look at the uh, two different algorithm refinement methods that, that I looked at for this paper. Again, they're available in more detail in the written paper, which you can download at the end of this video, um, but I'll just talk about them briefly here. Ensemble modeling again is running a group of models so that you obtain a statistical distribution of the predictions as you can see here and uh, one of the hyperparameters that you can optimize is that filter that i mentioned um, instead of striding over only three by three um, i could i've changed it here in this simple example to five by five so you have a larger search area that you're using in order to extract those feature maps with spatially dependent data like what we have here cracks and pctl segments it might be a bit advantageous to search or use a larger area to train the algorithm but there is likely a point of diminishing returns uh, this is a, a sensitive parameter that should be investigated if you're using spatial data. The other hyperparameter that I optimized as part of this paper was the error weighting scheme. So as I mentioned, it would be advantageous to incentivize my algorithm to do really well at capturing where the cracks are located and kind of downplay where there are no cracks. So what I did was I applied a weight to um, reward or incentivize the algorithm to learn where the cracks are located uh, better during training. Um, so let's look at the performance of the second attempt. So again, the two hyperparameters I looked at were error weighting. Uh, I gave the error for identifying uh, where there's no crack a 1% weight or importance and where there is a crack 100% weight or importance. And I also uh, changed the filter size through various different sizes but I found that the best performance was when it was 100 pixels by 100 pixels. And the details are in the paper on that one. Um, and I also ran an ensemble of 20 models. In this case, because this is a preliminary algorithm, a 20 seemed sufficient. But if I were to continue this work, I would probably look at running 100, if not more. So let's look at the performance now. Um, we have a global accuracy of 96%, which again is lower than previously. But if we dig in a little bit deeper, we have a mean accuracy of 70 7%, which is better across both classes. And now we are able to identify the crack locations with almost 59%, which is better than guessing. So again, this is an iterative process. So there are more of those steps that you can implement to incrementally improve the performance of your algorithm. So in summary for this paper, um, we found that 3D digital mapping can be leveraged to improve tunnel liner condition assessments and as-built records. Um, and it can be used to train machine learning algorithms relatively simply because you don't need to do any data formatting. It's already captured digitally. We also developed a convolutional neural network. And once we did those few steps of refining it, we were able to capture um, the crack locations with a global accuracy of 96%. And there are some future steps. So as I mentioned, there's always room for improvement, especially because we were at 60% accuracy for identifying crack locations, um, but we didn't take all the steps yet in order to um, improve that as much as it could be. So further work could be done there. And also the idea in this case was to develop this algorithm specifically for Ashford Bay but um, there's not so much variation between various PCTL segment designs that we couldn't test this at a different site to see how accurate it was there. So that concludes this presentation. If you're interested, I invite you to scan the QR code you see on the screen and connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you're interested in the details of the paper, you can download it at the link provided. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for listening and I appreciate your attention.